Good day and welcome to our webinar of today, the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers Nuclear Chapter webinar. We're going to talk to you a little bit about the present and future of power systems. Uh, we have a program lined up for you that will comprise of two speakers, Professor Slabber and Professor Nichols. Before we get started, just a few notes on webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure your volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. You'll get good streaming and your audio will run smoothly. You could ask questions via the questions panel, which is located on the GoToWebinar control panel. The chat function is reserved for the webinar organizers, but please continue and ask your questions on the questions panel. A recording of the presentation will be made available on the SAI YouTube channel, SAI TV. It will also be made available on our website. You could go to the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars and you'll find a copy there. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar once we get the CPD validation number from EXA. So thank you for your time this morning and please enjoy the conversation and and participate with the questions. I'll put my camera off now and I'll go over to the Science and Technology Study Committee. The committee again is focused on exploring the boundary conditions of nuclear science and engineering and technology applications and again looking at uh, solutions in the national interest. My name is Pat Naidu and I'm going to be your moderator for the day and uh, I will take you through and assist with facilitating the event. To start, we've got um, our colleague, Sibili Ntumbela, who's the chairperson of the power and energy section. Uh, Sibili is with ESCOM, and she's also a member of council at the Institute. Uh, she will formally welcome you to this morning's proceedings. Sibili has a BSc degree in electrical and electronic engineering from the University of Johannesburg. So over to Sibili, Sibili, for your welcome remarks. Sorry, uh, Prof. Kabila is not online at the moment. I think she's got technical issues. All right, thank you. We'll pass over and uh, on behalf of Sibili, let me welcome all to our, our proceedings of today. The power and energy section is the host section for the nuclear chapter at the Institute. We welcome all colleagues to join us in, as in membership of the Institute. It's a voluntary association serving in the national interest. Thank you. We'll move on. Our first speaker is Professor Johan Slaber. Professor Slaber is professor at the University of Pretoria. He's currently in the Department of Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering at the University of Pretoria. And he's involved in managing the degree in mechanical engineering, giving it a nuclear flavor. He's also part of the Center for Nuclear Safety and Security. This is part of the National Nuclear Regulator Accountability which is hosted by the University of Pretoria. In this regard, he holds the Chair of Nuclear Safety and Security, funded by the NNR, and he coordinates all NNR activities as managed by the University of Pretoria, again in association with other national and international institutions. Before joining the University of Pretoria, Professor Slabo was Chief Technology Officer of the Pebble Bed Modular Reactor Company, so South Africa's efforts at developing a small modular nuclear reactor. That effort still continues. He holds a doctorate in mechanical engineering from the University of Pretoria. And again, he was introduced to and trained in nuclear engineering at the Oak Ridge School of Reactor Technology in the United States. So welcome to Professor Slaber, And we look forward to your address this morning. And I'm going to now hand over the screen to Professor Slaber to do his presentation. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address you in connection with a new concept that we are looking at at the University of Pretoria. Before entering into my presentation, I would like just to 
to set the scene a little bit by giving you a few introductory uh, uh, items to chew on. And uh, I would like to start off with uh, announcements by the South African government from time to time that they will be growing the economy of South Africa. Now, I believe that everybody knows that the government is not the organization that can grow. The governments are the, 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 the bodies in countries that create a stable and attractive environment for people to be willing to invest and in doing so grow the economy of a specific country. Two resources that people would like to know what the constancy is, is electricity and also water for uh, certain processes and also for the people to be happy and healthy. Now, the objective of my presentation this morning is to come up with a suggestion to help solve our specific problems in South Africa. Uh, the proposed concept is called a power cell, which is a cohabitation of a small nuclear micro reactor and cohabitating with wind and solar power and feeding power into a very small mini, I call it mini, entirely green supply grid. And then my lecture concludes with just a bird's eye view uh, of uh, indicating the technology readiness in various areas and components of this power cell. And it will provide a basis from where and to focus on for our scientific and technological research that will be required to realize the proposal for the benefit, of course, for South, of South Africa, as well as the rest of Africa. And it's very important that we form a nucleus of technology development and uh, research and development to, to, to focus on a common goal. First of all, I would like just to put South Africa in the in a in in a, where South Africa performs in terms of certain metrics. The first metric is the Human Development Index, and that is a metric uh, which was developed by the United Nations to assess the social and economic development levels of countries, and it's a composite statistic of life expectancy, education, and per capita income. And that is related to an, another metric, and that is the electricity usage per capita in terms of energy, kilowatt hours per capita. And I would like to, to show you that it's got three, three uh, bands, a low human development, medium human development and high new human development. Now, where does South Africa fit into this picture? At the moment, uh, this is the kilowatt hours per capita uh, usage, and it's 3,537. It's more or less here. And if you take this up, it, it, it shows that we are just outside the band of medium human development. So we're entering in a good space. However, uh, it is still early days. What another metric, of course, is uh, a, a electricity production and consumption. Now, this, this statistics were taken from a, a study that was actually done in 1971, but it is still uh, it is still very, 
very uh, uh, um, applicable. Now, in this graph, which at this stage is st st still stationary, in this graph, every little dot here uh, identify a one country's movement through an, a life a total span of 40 years. And it, it will be a moving target uh, as it goes. And it, it contains 99 countries in total. And on the, 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 the abscess here, the gross domestic product produced per capita in, uh, in dollars, but it's normalized by means of uh, the Big Mac normalization. It's a little bit, uh, it's a, it, it, it looks a little bit flimsy, but it is used uh, uh, worldwide nowadays. It's the Purchase Power Parity Index. And then also here, the annual energy use per capita in gigajoules. So this is actually now applied, and I would like to show you as an audience where South Africa is. So as you, you can see, every country is moving these years uh, to some extent and it forms a little trajectory. Uh, and if we now freeze this uh, and 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 put South Africa in there, you can see South Africa is is lying below the line. Um, the per capita. If we feel for interest, we are not able to get away by line. Now, in the present, this looks like this. We have the same one, and we have the GD the same. And we've put the, the, the best fit which we had in here, which is this, this line, floating slightly and remembering this is a lock, lock. And freeze that. We do this point. This is the frozen line. This is the trajectory of all these little dots with uh, respect to, to, to this line. Australia moved a little bit ahead. The US is way above. And Brazil down here. India is down here. But it, it's all within the total band of, of, of other countries. And the question now is, where is South Africa now in 2020? Now, the statistics. I could get was only for 2018. However, it should not be very different now. And uh, it looks like this. South Africa sits below this, uh, one can say, least squares fit, way down here, 6,300 GDP per, per capita and just about 13 here. So there is a huge requirement for South Africa to, to move towards something which represents par with the rest of the world. So it needs to move in a trajectory upwards and rightwards. So uh, how can that be done? And what is the way forward? It is obvious in this graph that I showed that South Africa is really in need of large blocks of generating capacity. And it's urgent because we are falling behind at a huge pace. And uh, we need to be serious. And government should be serious about its objectives to get the economy growing at a rate. And this is the importance at a rate which is at least aligned with the population growth rate. Otherwise, 
we're going to go into a spiral downwards uh, with the unemployment rising and our economy dwindling and idling along. And I believe it is really late days that we start looking seriously at growing the production of electricity and we need reliable electricity and we know that and and we not we're not not supporting renewables but we not must not fool ourselves thinking that big investment will be drawn into south africa if uh, a constant supply of good electricity cannot be guaranteed. Uh, that uh, uh, power cuts and load sheds are not uh, the usual thing that happens. So we need to know and take note of it that a guaranteed constant supply of electricity is required before we can make a statement that we're going to grow the element elephant uh, the, the the economy in big bites however part of our solution will be to help to eat this big elephant in small bites uh, because we need big blocks of generating capacity but we need to also supply for human consumption and maybe smaller industries like mines and maybe small smelters, etc., etc., very locally, a, a, a plug to plug in to a constant supply of good power. So we can we can solve that problem and add power to the network in small quanta. And this small quanta, I term and we term, is to be seen as power cells. Uh, very much the same as the cell phones, where we have one area uh, supported by a local supply tower. And you get these cell phones that operate right through South Africa. And this proposal is to change now from a cell phone to an electricity uh, supply cell. Uh, so what is a power cell? And I'm going to go through uh, a, a schematic, but it consists of five major sections. Uh, first of all, the renewable energy section, wind and solar, because we, we don't hate them, but we see that they've got uh, shortages in their, in their offering. Uh, we've got a low carbon mini grid, which is actually fed by wind and solar. We need to smooth out the, the uh, erratic nature of the supply by means of some capacitor. We as electrical engineers, uh, let's talk about capacitors, smoothing out a fluctuating uh, voltage. So we need a facility for storing uh, thermal energy. We need something to supplement the, the nature, the, the variable nature of wind and solar by means of a small advanced micro reactor, an AMR and a coupled heat exchanger and then we need some power conversion by means of a gas turbine system uh, so i've 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 prepared a a uh, schematic diagram and i've divided into four or five blocks because i need to refer to these blocks separately so uh, block uh, and these blocks are indicated in this slide. So we've got now block one, which I term the renewable energy and the low carbon grid, which is fed by the wind, the propellers here, the wind turbines and this concentrated solar or 
or photovoltaic panels. And block two is then a smoothing capacitor, which is taking heat and convert uh, electricity, converting it to heat in a thermal storage. And we will see why it is now heat. And also, uh, I mean, there could be electricity also from the grid into some other facilities. But the block two is our smoothing condenser, which is in the form of a thermal storage. Block three is a very conventional, it looks complicated, but it's a very conventional turbine, turbo generator system. It's got a gas Brayton cycle, small off the shelf, turbo compressor and uh, a system, producing electricity and bootstrapping that electricity into heat or taking that electricity into other electricity users. That is block three and it's a conventional, a conventional off the shelf components. Block four is the focus of the science and technology that uh, we are proposing. This is the small advanced micro reactor plus a little heat exchanger and uh, that feeds then into, into the the conversion facility and then we've got block five which are the users and i've just uh, uh, indicated steam users it could be electricity users it could be process heat users it could be um, users like a combination of like mines they want maybe steam they want uh, electricity sasol for instance etc so this block is a combination block of users so let us just have a look at the development uh, the development state of each. Uh, what you see here uh, is just a, re a reference to four blocks. Now, the fifth block is is the use are the users. Now block one, which is now the wind and solar power and the green grid, is well developed. It's already being used. But uh, maybe some improvements in efficiencies, etc. This block two is a energy storage bank. Uh, I refer to a, as a, a as a capacitor, a energy capacitor. Uh, it's being done on a worldwide basis uh, for concentrated solar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we can tag onto that development. And as I said, the power conversion block, there's really no development return uh, required because uh, they are off the shelf. And the design of the cell is such that stock standard components can be used for, uh, for, for uh, in the system, maybe with some uh, small adaptations in uh, in characteristics for optimum performance block number four is the micro reactor development and this is the the focal point of the the nuclear chapter management to develop science and technology because although the focus is to stay very close to existing technologies, nuclear technologies and the reactor technologies that has been developed worldwide. Stay very close, but make it smaller uh, and make it more appetizing for to tackle in South Africa. So let me take you through the description of this proposed micro reactor. And we have done some ample uh, pre-calculations to, to make sure that what I'm saying here is not just a lot of garbage. It can be done. Uh, this reactor is a small 10 megawatt thermal helium gas cooled reactor that heats air through a heat exchanger to a, around 700 degrees centigrade. The secondary side of the heat exchanger that I have shown is 
is, is, is actually interfacing with air being compressed into the system and uh, it heats up the air. Uh, this heated air then becomes the energy carrier to drive the rest of the thermodynamic cycle as indicated above. Now, I have uh, shown in the schematic that this air can drive a turbine, but it can be fed through the thermal storage to increase its temperature from 700 to 1100 or 1000 or 1100 maybe. And that will then drive a, a, a typical turbo generator uh, which is used for the diesel diesel generator sets. Uh, very similar because the combustion temperature is in the order of a thousand degrees. The fuel is in the form of uranium dioxide or uranium uh, oxycarbide microspheres coated with graphite and silicon carbide. And the silicon carbide uh, is the presents the first barrier to the against the release of fission products from the fissioned uranium and which is the focus of uh, the main the first focus of a safe design these microspheres are, are then contained in silicon carbide tubes and the space in between the silicon carbide uh, the, the coated particles and the silicon carbide wall is a lead bismuth eutectic alloy that serves to transfer heat from the, the coated particles to the tube wall. And this tube forms the fuel assembly. It's sealed on both sides, and this is the fuel assembly. And the silicon carbide tube wall functions now as the secondary containment of the fission products. Now, I, I just want to interrupt myself by saying that one of the, the big uh, uh, positive safety characteristics of a high temperature reactor is the integrity at high temperatures of the silicon carbide and its ability to stop fission products from leaving and being released into the coolant. The coolant flowing is flowing around this, these tubes and before it can get to the coolant, the fission products must first cross the first silicon carbide and then the second silicon carbide. And then it is within the pressure boundary of the reactor. Now this tube is the fuel assembly and the silicon carbide tube wall functions as a secondary containment as I said. These fuel assemblies are then loaded in a monoblock graphite structure that forms the core of the micro reactor. It's just, and, and it is the, the moderator, main moderator of this, the neutrons in the reactor. The design of the core is for use of high assay. And this is actually enrichment, high in the low enrichment enrichment band so it's 19 percent and the reactor can operate for a period of five years between fuel reloads so it's, it spans a long time and it can be coupled into the cell and it operates there for a long time so uh, uh, what is the level of development of this micro reactor now, I just want you to, to be aware that we're not unaware that uh, things and proposals like this takes a long time to realize and one must be go into a project like this open-eyed. Uh, it is still early days in the type of this type of reactor worldwide because worldwide the focus is being turned towards small micro reactors for decentralized operation. So it's early days, but in the design, it is a requirement 
to stay as close to well-tested and proved concepts that require mainly adaptation to a smaller format. I'm talking about specifically the fuel, the primary fuel, which, which are the coated particles, which has been done for the PBMR reactor, and it proved to be superior to the best fuel coated particles that the Germans have made. Not to boast too much for South Africa, but we had the Germans to help us to produce these coated particles. So we've got the technology and we've, we have it still in a workable situation on the Pelindaba site. However, throughout the technological development, the words of Admiral Hyman Rickover, he was the father of the nuclear power reactor program in the US in the early days, but we need to keep it, <coughs> sorry, uh, as, a, as our slogan. And that is, <clears throat> we've got two types of reactors. We've got the academic reactor with the characteristics. It is simple, it is small, it is cheap, it is light, it can be built very quickly. It is very flexible in purpose. Very little development will be required. It will use off the shelf components. The reactor is in the study phase and it's not being built now. But on the other hand, the practical reactor, and this is where science and technology must first kick in and help us to make sure that what we propose is a practical reactor. So a practical reactor, according to uh, Admiral Rickover, it can be distinguished by it is being built now, it is behind schedule, it requires an immense amount of development on apparently trivial items. It is very expensive, it takes a long time to build because of engineering, engineering development problems. It is large, it is heavy, it is complicated. However, the tools of an academic designer is a piece of paper and an eraser. If a mistake is made, it can always be erased and changed. However, if the practical reactor designer is, he wears the mistake around his neck and cannot be erased and everyone sees it. The, these were the words of Admiral Rickover but we should take note of it. And this should be our motto throughout our technological development ongoing. The proposal, and what is the proposal of the reactor life cycle? And we should see this now in terms of the South African scenario. Uh, we, 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 the, we designed the reactor so that it can be manufactured and assembled in the total, in total in, in, in South African factories. In other words, it does not require these monstrosities of, of uh, forgings, forged vessels that you'd have to import. It can be loaded with fuel at, at our new, uh, South African Nuclear Energy Corporation. Uh, the fuel is fabricated there. It is sealed and shipped to site where it cohabitates with wind and solar. And then after its lifetime of five to eight years, we will see if we can use burnable poison. It is shipped back on a, a low, it is shipped back to the site uh, and, and it could be reloaded at Nexa. So as I said before, its use is to provide clean energy to communities, meaning communities which we want to grow, and also industries that we want to grow. It can be configured to desalinate water. It can supply hydrogen by high temperature electrolysis. It can store energy in the form of heat. The waste heat is available for as process heat. So what does it mean in general for South Africa? It is suggested that Nexa at Pelindaba 
becomes the hub for the development and research in collaboration with universities and the South African industry. Stressing the South African industry because we would like to, to have some inflow of interesting projects into the industry and create a carrot for growth. This will infuse new life into Nexa since it will be provide a common goal for research and development, which according to, and this is my personal view, I was actually sponsored by the Nexa people in my early days to go to Oak Ridge. So to my view, I'm just comparing. It is totally missing at this moment that there is such a central focus they say that uh, if you fly a plane and you correct your height, comparing your, your height with the local pressure on the outside of the plane, you will fly in up and down, up and down, because the comparison on the next, on next to the plane is not very stable. But if you fly to a beacon, which is an objective, you fly straight. And I believe we need to have some beacon to fly to. And Nexo will become, a, again, a sparkling organization in South Africa. Now, Nexo was chosen at the site where the Pelindaba is at the moment to be close to universities and the South African other institutions like the CSIR, etc. Et so in this way, South African universities will become involved in activities identified in this hub in a number of areas. If And if managed properly, it will contribute synergistically uh, to be, produce an excellent product. The South African industry will be stimulated to form part of the supply chain in a number of technological areas. The establishment of new industries will be stimulated since constant power supply can now then be uh, guaranteed. And the end product will form part of a grand plan to supply green energy and possibly also desalinated water to some populations. We need to do that. And as engineers and scientists, we are, uh, are obliged not to focus on other things, but to improve the condition, the living condition of the people of South Africa and also to, 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 to the rest of Africa. So the power cell provides this possibility to provide energy to users of high temperature process heat also. So the, my last words after introducing the concept of the power cell is South African needs. And we need to put the needs in red there as soon as possible to implement its newer, newer nuclear power expansion program, but also to be able to add in small quantities like power cells, power to a green grid. And I'm just quoting Henry Kissinger that said, in decision after decision, policy makers have failed to grasp the significance of the problem of conjecture, sometimes underestimating the benefits of preemption and sometimes underestimating the costs of inaction. So I believe it is high time that South Africa preempts our, our, uh, the, 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 the further decline in the living conditions, the unemployment, and with force enter into something which is well adapted to the needs, the, the, the urgent needs 
of South Africa at the moment. So I have uh, emphasized the costs because even if the power production is, is more expensive in the beginning, it, it will later on become a little bit, it will, it will go down as a result of the economy of scale. The more you build, the cheaper, they say cheaper by the dozen. But we need to do something now, otherwise the cost of inaction is going to go sky high. I thank you. Thank you for listening and for you that watched also. Thank you. Uh, first class, first class, Professor Slabber, an excellent presentation. Thank you. We'll come Thanks. back to questions. Let's bring on uh, Professor Nichols. Um, I'm going to take back the screen from you and I'm going to introduce Professor Nichols. Uh, Professor Nichols is with the team at the University of Johannesburg and he's also non-executive chairperson of the board at NEXA, at the Nuclear Energy Corporation of South Africa. Uh, Dave started his career in the Royal Navy and he's played around with lots of reactors, small reactors, big reactors. He arrived in ESCOM and continued his uh, career at Kuburg and he did a a top class work at Kuburg. I know Dave from those early days and uh, concluded his career as chief nuclear officer. And as you can see, Kuburg's delivering now for us 40 years of sterling performance. Dave was appointed as chairperson of the board of NEXA for the period 2020 to 2023. So he's going to be around for some time. So he'll certainly get Professor Slabber's micro reactor operational and onto the uh, South African platform. So over to Dave and Dave, uh, let us have your contribution to this conversation on micro reactors. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Pat. Um, I, I, when I listened to Johan, Johan talk about this small reactor, I'm torn back to think of when I started, when we started the PPMR project, we were told that 100 megawatts was too small to be a commercial machine. That the power that be had decided, as the IAEA, that nuclear plants, there were large ones above 1200 megawatts, there were medium ones for 900 to 1200, and there were small ones from 600 to 900 megawatts. But there couldn't be anything commercial that was smaller than 600. And I like to believe that's changed, but when you do your research, you realize what happened. And that is that back in the 50s and the early 60s, uh, there was a lot of interest in small, essentially off-grid nuclear plants. The American army put together about 10 such reactors of different designs they actually built, and they ran a collection of them from the early 60s to the early 70s to provide power at a range. The smallest one I can find was 1.2 megawatts electrical, the biggest one was, was 10 megawatts. Um, but these ran reasonably successfully. And the trouble with the industry, in my opinion, and I realize increasingly when you look back at your own history that you were part of this process, we fell in love with, with size and efficiency. We fell in love with the idea that nuclear plants needed to be big to get the economies of scale, to maximize the efficiency of, for example, fuel use. So increasingly complex devices were developed in regimes to run plants and increasingly large machines were built. But there was an incredibly solid background of different technologies applied to reactors in the field of around, let's say, anything under up to 10 megawatts. And in fact, when you look at these machines carefully, you realize their size and their cost would probably be very competitive. So I'm really excited by the micro uh, reactor that the that, 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 that University of Pretoria is looking at. Um, I would certainly be pretty happy to see Nexa playing a role in this. But I think what we've got to recognize is that maybe the industry as a whole lost its way when it went into bigger and bigger and bigger machines to the extent that it becomes unhandleable, and certainly for Africa unhandleable. 
and the concept of a small, very small reactor at an industrial scale, a couple of megawatts, is absolutely fascinating. And with modern fuel technology like the triso particle fuel or variants of that that were developed by the, the British and the Germans back in the 1960s and 70s and was in a sense almost perfected by the, by, 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 by the, by the team at Pelindaba under the PBMR, maybe there's a window out here. Maybe there's a window of building a machine that is gonna change things dramatically. Certainly in Africa, we need to have small machines. If you look at the big machines in Africa, the only grids in Africa that are big enough to take 1,000 megawatt machines is South Africa and Egypt. We have nuclear plant at 1,000 megawatts. Egypt is building four of them now as we speak. So the rest of Africa needs something in the order of 10 to 100 megawatts to make it a viable system. So I look forward to the discussion, but I'm a complete believer that what we're looking at here is a very realistic way forward um, of looking at small modular reactors where we don't get too hung up on the exact efficiency of the machine, but, over, but more of the overall impact on society. And my last comment I'll put is people say, but we can manage the interoperability of renewables in the system. And I will just comment that everybody in South Africa who has been plagued by load shedding in the last 12 years now, and who has said, if only we had reliable power, we could get more heavy industry, because heavy industry doesn't come if power is reliable, must realize that in the worst year of load shedding, ESCOM actually shed less than 0.7% of its total demand. In other words, we now know that any load shedding, even 1% load shedding, is fundamentally disastrous for the system. And as such, I point to everybody who looks at industrial growth in this country and realize that the stability of the power supply and the reliability is by far the most important characteristic for industrial development of the country. And with that, I'll hand back to Pat. I'm not making a presentation, some quick comments from myself, but I look forward to the questions coming out of the um, uh, attendees. Chairman, thank you. Well spoken. Let's go to questions, and I'm going to look through the question poll. And we've got a few comments here. And thank you, colleagues. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, we've got uh, one from France. Is, is the gas turbine shown in block three? Um, you want to talk a little bit about that, uh, Prof uh, Slabber, your gas turbine in block three for France? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, we have not, we have opted not to put the, the fine details in. It was just to show that uh, that will be a conventional gas turbine block. Uh, it, it can consist of a number of turbines, and as I said, it uh, will definitely use the Brayton cycle first of all, and then the, the, there could be a combination with a Rankin cycle, et cetera. But the block three is configured such that it can accommodate and use and utilize uh, off-the-shelf uh, turbo, uh, turbo generator systems. That's all I can uh, say at the moment, because uh, we are still in a... Uh, uh, a design and optimization phase, and I did not put in the details of right. what we have at the moment. Right, right. Now, thank you for that. And I think Rob Lloyd will, uh, has posted the next uh, question. And Rob wants to know about the efficiency of the micro reactor and um, possibly also expanding on Rob's point. Why don't you get the technology from the nuclear subs and the U.S. warships and we develop it further? So I think uh, uh, if you could respond to the first one on the efficiency of the micro reactor. Uh, the, 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 the total efficiency of the, the system itself uh, is not, is not, uh, has not been done. Uh, however, the, uh, as everybody knows, uh, thermodynamic cycles 
right. do have a very big uh, relationship with efficiency. So the drive in this design is to to raise the temperature of the first uh, conversion cycle, and then also use uh, in combination with that that the the the, the heat that is uh, released after after uh, expanding in the summer uh, in the in the turbine so the reactor itself is just uh, the normal uh, uh, the, the the normal heat produced per fission 3.1 times 10 to the power 10 fissions per watt second and that is it uh, and then comes the the conversion in in to uh, and to heat the air and in the cycle, you will see that the origin of the air before it enters the, the compressor, which was just shown schematically, was just taken out of the air. But the, the design will use some form of a recycling system so that we can conserve some of the, the waste heat as well. Uh, and uh, then we we are planning, and the design is conceptually feasible, to use as the heat exchanger a heat pipe heat exchanger. In other words, make uh, the heat exchanger also a little bit more efficient. So there are a number of areas of of uh, of improvement, but to uh, to state what the, the overall efficiency of the system is is at this these early days not possible but i can assure that the drive in the technology development of course will be to up and increase the efficiency to uh, to a level which is 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 good and acceptable right and you'll do it at every stage and every opportunity no, that's thank you. part of the technology thank you yeah Thank you. Uh, I've got another one from, uh, yeah, Rob Lloyd says thank you. He's happy with that response. Um, you just I've got another one from, yes, sorry, Pat, sorry, Dave. The other question was about sorry, nuclear submarines, which I think is in my area from history. Yes, yes, please do that. Yes. So just quickly, I, I don't think nuclear submarines were designed without economics or safety being major issues. They were designed for robustness and uh, compactness and I personally believe that the water cooled technology um, has some inherent drawbacks in power generation we got into water cooled reactors because it worked in submarines and nobody gave a damn for the economics of the things and no one really gave a damn for safety um, I remember being at sea and being told very clearly that um, once we were beyond, the, the, beyond more than three miles from shore, we were safe because the great British public, we were expendable as crew. Um, and, um, but to go further than that is that if we're going to look at ways to exploit the temperature of a nuclear, react, of a nuclear reaction, and that's an important thing about it, the temperature of a nuclear reaction is essentially infinite. If you, if you burn a chemical fuel, you end up with a stoichiometric limit in other words at a certain temperature you don't get any reaction because you're above the temperature of the reaction there's no such limit on a nuclear reactor you're sitting at millions of degrees centigrade before you get you you're essentially getting into fusion reactors if you get to the mate where the reaction stops so the trick is why are we using a coolant that requires to be pressurized to keep it from boiling so anybody who's looking at a modern uh, low cost simple reactor will look for something where you can have high temperature in the coolant without having high pressure and clearly you, you therefore want to avoid boiling so you've got things like lead cooled reactors like gas cooled reactors because gas is not it like um, um, molten salt reactors so I personally think that if we are going down the line of small very small reactors um, then and, 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 and even anything under 100 megawatts, we should be looking at different technologies than the classical light water reactors that were designed for very specific technical needs in the 50s and 60s um, and haven't changed since. Um, 
Uh, the thing I will just comment is everyone tells me nuclear reactors can't change load. That's one statement. That's, of course, completely untrue. A nuclear submarine could change load absolutely dramatically. We go from zero, from yeah. about 10% power to 90% power in about two minutes. So the, the concept is just that with your fuel cost being low, no one tries to load follow the, the, the nuclear reactors. With that, I'll pass back to you, Pat. But um, no, taking submarine reactors and putting them ashore is not going to be a cost-effective solution for anybody. No, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good experience coming through there. I've got a comment here from France, and uh, France says, ESCOM should have thought about microgrids fed from solar and wind with battery storage for the rural communities, and uh, that could have been a, a a, an affordable solution in lieu of long power lines that will then connect the people to thermal carbon-based power. And no, I agree with France, and I think ESCOM has embarked on that France. Uh, I've seen uh, uh, pilot programs that they've launched and they've got uh, microgrids operating in the free state and very successfully. So, so they have considered that and they are building on it. I think ESCOM is just... Large. Yesterday, Pat, Pat, I'm going to argue with you terribly. Black in the 1990s, um, uh, ESCOM went heavily into rural electrification with PV, Sorry. those kind of things. And with due respect, it did not actually meet the needs of the public that was being fed to. Um, yeah. Earlier, uh, the shell program. I batteries, the batteries are still horribly expensive. They're getting better, but they're, uh, they're getting better to get down to the cost per kilowatt installed of lead-acid batteries from 1859. Right. Right. Now, thank you for that. Yeah, I guess they've they've made made some improvements, and uh, hopefully they'll they'll continue growing that opportunity. I don't see any further questions on the on the chat box. I'm going to just give a few comments, and then. Uh, Please join me in this uh, conversation. Uh, Dave and I had the opportunity to visit uh, Xinhua University. And when we walked onto the campus, we had a good conversation with the professors there. And they took us across and uh, showed us their laboratory. They had a 10 megawatt thermal helium cooled gas reactor on campus, built and operational. And they were quite proud of the achievement there. Dave, your comments on that reactor, the Xinhua University uh, laboratory? Well, the Xinhua reactor is one of the uh, reference points of high temperature reactors because it was the first new one started up after the 1960s sort of and 70s attempts. Um, what was most interesting about that design, um, it's a very similar, it's a pebble bed reactor, very similar to, to the basics, the exact same as a PBMR is going to be, um, is they did an experiment just to prove safety. Uh, on that plant. And the experiment they did was they locked the control rods in place so they didn't insert into the reactor. And then they stopped the blower, i.e. they stopped circulating the helium. Now, if you tried that with, with Kuberg, life would get really exciting. Um, the reality was that because of the physics and the materials of the high temperature gas core reactor, Basically, absolutely nothing happened. It just heated up slowly. If they'd left it alone, it would heat it up for the next day or two and then cool down later. So I think what's important is, into, and, and that may in fact be indicating one of the issues on safety, is that the early view of the engineers was, I can build this reactor and then make it safe by adding two spare pumps and two diesel generators to make sure I get water in in case of an accident. What we've shown is that life is not that simple. It's much, e it is actually cheaper to build the safety into the reactor at the beginning with the penalties that incurs in a slightly bigger reactor, maybe slightly less efficient. And then you don't have other safety systems. And that I think is a lesson. But the Chinese are fascinating that, that, they've, that, that they are now about to, they are just in the process of commissioning their new, uh, the first real SMR in the world, which is the HDRPM in, 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 in Qindao. Uh, in China, um, and that's a 200 megawatt electrical machine fed by two pump bed reactors. Um, right. And it would be a very exciting way forward, but uh, much bigger than what we talked about by um, um, uh, Johan. And also, its fuel is much more conventional HDR fuel, not the uh, uh, coated particle lead bismuth solution that I think sounds very exciting from um, 
new patients. Thanks. No, thanks. That can, can I it's add some on. comment yes, to what uh, what David Please said? Uh, we had at uh, there are four four uh, attributes of the next generation reactors which are specified uh, by the generation four international forum and they, they, these are enhanced safety proliferation resistance right. uh, minimized weight waste and right. uh, sustainability and economical Excellent. so uh, what uh, 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 the, the 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 highest on this order is enhanced safety of course Right. And at PBMR, which was a gas cooled reactor design, we had the pyramid of safety or the triangle of safety. First of all, the material, the fuel, the integrity of the fuel itself. That is of prime importance. In other words, you can overheat it uh, to a point which uh, is normally not reachable and it still uh, conserves its integrity. The next is the material. The next in these this triangle is the materials used, uh, and the third is the geometry. So right. the materials, the fuel, and the materials must be able to withstand high temperatures and conserve its geometry. The 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 the, the, the geometry itself, in which the reactor is packed, is such that the heat generated after the fission reaction has terminated, in other words, the decay heat or the heat up due to the fission product decay is removed by the natural processes, conduction, radiation and convection. And there's no active uh, means by means of which the reactor can be kept cool. So the fuel, yeah. summarize the fuel integrity, the material integrity and the geometry all those all that three uh, mm. combines to build to to provide a reactor with natural inherent safety first class first class now this is coming through very very strongly in your proposed power cell concept professor i think uh, let me start wrapping up now i don't see much more excitement from the chat box I think in the words of Admiral Richover, you know, pen plus paper plus eraser, that is where we need to go. And I think as fellow South Africans, can I invite uh, colleagues uh, to join us in study as we help Professor Slabber and the team develop this concept towards commercialization. Uh, I think today we've got a little bit more than just pen plus paper plus eraser. We've got some very, very fancy computer tools Professor Simon Cornell and the team at UJ are available to assist, and we could get that all to work for us. I also would like to compliment Professor Slabber on his presentation, and I would like to assist him in carrying forward this presentation. And I think we need to go and sit down and have a conversation with the Energy Intensive User Group. This is a group that comprises uh, the energy intensive customers, in particular the mining and industrial category. We should also go and have a conversation with SALGA, the South African Local Government Association, uh, together with the AMEU, the Associated Municipal Electricity Undertakings, on the opportunity to introduce the technology into the municipal environment. And we also agree that they could add on their renewable energy uh, components to it. We should go and have a chat with the Chamber of Mines, and in particular with the technology arm at Mintech and bring them on board. And uh, hopefully we'll get some traction with them. And then also with the universities, South African universities, I'll talk to the CEO of South African universities to give us some support so that we could uh, bring forward the collective minds of South Africa that's resident at all our universities. And thank you, Professor Slabber for working with us from University of Pretoria together with the team at University of Johannesburg, University of Witwatersrand. I think we, we, we're getting some good traction there. And then finally, I'd like you to do a presentation to the South African Academy of Engineers. I'm going to set it up. And I think this nexus of energy and water has come through very strongly in your proposal. 
and um, and I'm sure the colleagues at the academy would enjoy your presentation. So, colleagues, uh, let me thank you for your participation this morning, and uh, we look forward to your support and your continued interest on this subject. And let's see how best we can collectively work and provide leadership uh, going forward. So with that uh, to note, we'll conclude the webinar for today and we'll show our appreciation to Professor Slaver and Professor Nichols uh, for hosting us today. Thank you, colleagues, and uh, thank you very much and enjoy the day and be thank safe. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Do, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dave.